Hello, my name is Dino Ross, and today we are going to be looking at the construction of an income statement and a balance sheet for limited liability companies. The uh, topic itself is a fairly long one, so feel free to break this video up into manageable chunks so that you don't miss any vital information. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is the different types of limited liability companies. So you have two types. One is known as a public limited and the other one is known as a private limited company. The limited liability company um, concept is um, where you have a divorce of ownership between the shareholders who are the equivalent of owners in a sole trader or a partnership and the actual business itself. So in the eyes of the law a limited company is its own being. It's like a separate entity or has a separate identity from the shareholders who have invested into starting that company. And because of that, unlike with a sole trader or a partnership, they have what's known as limited liability, i.e. limited responsibility to pay the debts of the company. So if the company goes bankrupt and it's a limited liability company, the shareholders who have invested only ever lose the amount of money that they invested into the company. So let's say I'm a shareholder, I invested $10,000, I bought $10,000 worth of shares. That's the amount I would lose if the company went bankrupt. So they couldn't come and take away my personal assets such as a car or a house. Um, and it's obviously a very attractive company to set up as a result because every entrepreneur knows I've put this amount of money into the company and that's all I'm ever going to lose if things go wrong in the worst case scenario. The main focus of this video is on actually private limited companies. Um, but the difference between the two is just uh, that a public limited company um, can sell its shares on the stock exchange. So you may have heard of the NASDAQ in the US or the FTSE in London. Uh, these stock exchanges are like giant supermarkets, basically, for buying and selling shares. And they are reserved for the biggest companies in each of those countries. Um, and as a result, if you want to put your shares for sale on the stock exchange, then you must have invested uh, an amount into the company greater than $50,000. If you want a limited company, which is smaller in size, and the shares aren't available for anyone over the age of, age of 18 to buy on the stock exchange, then you wouldn't choose the public limited company, you would choose a private limited company, which as I said is the focus of this video in terms of constructing uh, an income statement and balance sheet. So the differences between the two. A public limited company can sell its shares on the stock exchange of the country. Uh, the company name, if it's a public limited company, must, after the name, list the letters PLC, which stands for public limited company. And you have to have at least invested 50,000. I mean, most companies, you know, like Facebook, have probably got millions and millions of dollars worth of, share, of shares for sale on the stock exchange. If you're a private limited company, your shares are private. In other words, they can't be bought or sold on the stock exchange. And actually what that means is um, that you can only sell shares to friends or other business partners if all the existing shareholders agree to take them in. All right, so if you had a board of directors and you had all the shareholders and one of them decided they didn't want that partner or that new shareholder or investor to come in and invest in that company, then it just simply wouldn't happen. So, you know, that's the reason why we call it private, because in some ways, not just anyone can buy shares in that particular type of limited liability company. If you're a private limited company, you have to list the letters LTD after your name, which stands for uh, limited, uh, and in this case means private limited, and usually your share capital will not exceed $50,000. Okay, so it tends to be um, smaller companies, but bigger than partnerships and sole traders. 
So when uh, the private or public limited company decides to sell shares, there are two types of share that they can sell. And I have seen this come up in exams in terms of uh, being able to understand the difference between a preference share, which is the first type of share that you can sell, and the more common share is known as an ordinary share. So in most cases, a company sells ordinary shares, but they reserve some special preference shares, usually for the directors or the um, higher value shareholders, you know, the bigger names, directors, managing directors, etc. Okay, so the difference between the two is a preference share gets a guaranteed um, amount for every share that they own, whereas an ordinary shareholder will get a variable amount uh, in terms of how the profits are paid out. So the directors at the end of the year usually will look at the amount of profit made in the income statement and then decide how much of that they're going to give their shareholders, whether they be preference or ordinary shareholders. If you own a preference share, you're guaranteed to get a fixed amount, whereas an ordinary shareholder in good years will get more, in bad years will get less. So most company directors will have a small amount of preference shares and a larger amount of ordinary shares because they're hoping if they've made the right decisions as directors, the company uh, will be in a position to reward the ordinary shareholders with a large dividend. But the risk you take is that it changes according to the performance of the company each year. So in good years, uh, the directors may pay uh, from the profits a large amount of dividends, and in bad years, obviously, they would pay would pay less. So here, if we took two shares, one is a preference share, and it costs a hundred dollars, and the other one here uh, is an ordinary share that costs a hundred dollars. This is the difference with the hundred dollar share price, which is a preference share. They would always get a fixed dividend. So in this case, just for example, it is ten dollars, which means that. At the end of the year, you're always going to get 10% of the amount that you paid. So you paid $100. If you get $10 back, um, then that's 10% on the amount that you invested in the preference share. That's good because during good and bad times, you know exactly what you're going to get at the end of the year. Uh, with an ordinary share, it changes. The dividend paid, the profits paid to the shareholders, depends on whether it's a good year or a bad year. So in a good year, if you've paid the same amount for an ordinary share, $100. It might be that the directors decide to be very generous and they give you $15 for that $100 share, in which case you've done better than your preference share. Or it may be a bad year and your company hasn't performed as well and they only pay you a dollar for the same $100 share. And that's the risk you take by buying an ordinary share. As I said though, most shares that are available on the stock market are ordinary shares. The preference shares tend to be few and far between and usually are made as um, sort of sweeteners to the big directors, you know, the big, uh, the big owners in the, in the, in the um, limited company. So some other differences between the two. A preference share um, uh, owner isn't allowed to vote at the annual general meeting. They have no power in terms of decision-making within the company. They simply are investing their money for a fixed return, but they don't take any part in the running or the control of the business. But if the company does close down and they sell off the assets of the company, because they own preference shares, if any assets are sold and money is given back to the shareholders who've lost their investment in the company, the preference shareholders always get that money first. So that's an advantage of having a preference share. If you have an ordinary share, you receive a variable dividend each year. So in good, uh, good times, you'll get more money than a preference shareholder. Bad times, you'll get less. But the big advantage of an ordinary shareholder uh, share is that as a shareholder, you get to vote in the meetings and you get to take part in the decision making at the end of the financial year and during the financial year. Uh, but on the downside, if the company goes bankrupt and they sell the assets of the company, as an ordinary shareholder, you're the last person to receive any money. So if they say sold off land and buildings, the preference shareholders would get the first chunk of money and then the ordinary shareholders 
uh, would get anything that's left after the preference shareholders have been paid off. So the authorised share capital and issued share capital is um, fundamentally different in as far as the authorised is how much uh, capital you've been given permission by um, the government to authorise as a um, as capital to a company in that particular country. So if we looked here, for example, um, it could be that you're licensed to sell $125,000 worth of shares. But many, many companies don't um, call up all the share capital or sell all the share capital right at the beginning. They keep some in case they um, want to sell more capital um, in the form of shares um, to raise extra funds to perhaps fund an expansion project. So in this particular example here, they have permission to sell $125,000 worth. That's the authorised share capital. But they've actually only issued $75,000 worth of shares. In other words, they've only sold $75,000 worth of shares. So if we look here at the example of Trotter Enterprises Limited, this is a private limited company because it has LTD after the name, um, Trotter Enterprises. And um, <clears throat> this company has been given by the government um, permission, or it's been authorised by the government to sell 100,000 ordinary shares, at $1 each, and 25,000 preference shares, also at the price of $1 each. The company actually has decided to only issue out of the 100,000 shares it has permission to issue, it's going to only sell $50,000 worth of ordinary shares and it's going to sell the whole 25,000 preference shares to um, various parties, usually the directors. Um, none of the shares have been fully paid, so although they've sold them, they haven't called all the money up for each share. So let's say, for example, a share costs a dollar, as in in this case, then what they've actually um, called for, what they've asked for, is only 80 cents out of the dollar for each share. Now, why would a company do that? Well, especially new companies, to try and give um, investors an incentive, they'll say, yeah, come along, invest in our company, uh, buy some shares, but we'll sell you the shares for a dollar, but you only have to pay 80 cents at the beginning. And then at the end of the year, when we've done well, you can give us the other 20 cents, uh, which will take, um, take you to full payment for each share that you own. So in this case, the called up share capital is going to be uh, 0.8 for both the preference and ordinary shares. So if we go back to the beginning, the authorised share capital, you've got 100,000 ordinary shares and 25,000 preference. That would give you an authorised money value of $125,000 worth of ordinary and preference shares. They only issued uh, 50,000 ordinary shares at a dollar each and 25,000 of the preference at a dollar each. 50 times one would give you 50,000 plus $25,000 uh, for the preference shares, which in total would give you $75,000. But remember, they only called 80 cents, so they only asked for 80 cents out of the whole dollar for each share. So that means that if you multiply 0.8 instead of the dollar that they should have received, by the $50,000 worth of ordinary shares and 0.8 by the $25,000 worth of preference shares, what you've actually called up is $60,000. Um, all the share shareholders have paid up except for someone who hasn't paid up $200. We call that a call in arrears. In other words, they are behind in the uh, called up payment of share capital. So. Dividends are the amount of um, the net profit that is paid out by the directors to the shareholders as a reward for investing in the company. Uh, most companies pay a dividend at the end of the financial year um, and it's announced at the AGM. But um, some companies, especially the larger ones, will pay a dividend, um, they call an interim dividend, halfway through the year and then another dividend at the end of the year.
The dividends payable is shown in the profit and loss appropriation accounts on an income statement. So at the end of the uh, trading and profit and loss account, when you've calculated your net profit, you add on an extra part known as an appropriation account. And the word appropriation, it simply means division. So how is the net profit divided and of course some of that net profit will go towards paying the dividends to shareholders. The dividends payable of course is shown as um, an entry into your profit and loss uh, appropriation account as stated earlier um, but it should be noted that in most cases because the dividend um, is only decided towards the end of the year by the directors who generally are quite um, careful about giving out dividends because uh, the directors tend to be majority shareholders who are ambitious and want the company to expand. So they'd rather retain the profit than pay it out as a dividend. But because it's announced the dividend at the end of the year, often you only find out as a shareholder how much you're going to get at the annual general meeting. So the payment actually made um, as a reward in the form of a dividend from the net profits is usually uh, owing to those uh, shareholders um, at a later date. So often the dividend payable will also be shown as a current liability because it still hasn't been paid to the shareholders and is owed to them uh, in the future. Um, so the retained profit, um, which is the profit that's left after you have given the dividends to the shareholders, um, is usually divided up into um, what we call reserves. And a reserve's a bit like a treasure chest. It's an amount of money put aside from the net profit with a specific function. So if you look at the Japanese, for example, they will often create what's known as a fixed asset reserve and they will put part of their net profits into this reserve in order to pay for new fixed assets, usually machinery, at the end of a time period. So it's almost like saving money, I suppose, from your profits to pay for a fixed asset in the future. And the Japanese renew their machinery every three years, um, the, the larger companies, so that they're always ahead of the game in terms of technology. So they put aside at least 25% of their retained profit every year um, to be able to pay for fixed assets in the future. Of course, you may also have other reserves like a general reserve that might um, help to fund expansion, for example. So in this, exa in this particular case, you had a net profit of $100,000. Um, so if you paid out $25,000 as a dividend, which would be very generous, 25% of your uh, total net profit, that means, of course, you would have a retained profit of $75,000, which you then may divide up into different types of reserve according to what function you want to use your net profit for. So the final item that you might see in the final accounts of a limited liability company is known as a debenture. So what is a debenture? A debenture is simply a loan that is taken from the general public. And it's usually uh, conducted through the stock exchange. So on the stock exchange, you can buy shares, ordinary or preference, but you can also, if you wanted to invest, uh, you could also invest in a debenture. So how does it work? Well, in most cases, companies have uh, borrowed all the money they can borrow from the bank. So to borrow money, uh, they need to go to the general public and ask for their money, if you like, through the stock exchange. And the debenture um, is simply a promise on a piece of paper, similar to the one I've drawn um, at the bottom of this video. And on it, it will have the cost. So in this case, they want to borrow $10,000 from the general public and a promise on it to pay a fixed amount of annual or yearly interest. In this case, that's 10%. And on it you will also usually have the lifespan of the debenture. So in this case, let's suppose it's uh, five years. So if um, an investor wanted to buy a debenture, they would go to the stock exchange, they'd be given this piece of paper, and in return, they would give over to the company the $10,000. And the company gets to use that $10,000 for five years. But at the end of each year, it has to pay the promised amount of interest, which in this case is $1,000. That thousand dollars is an expense. It's the cost of borrowing money. And in the same way that interest on a bank loan would be shown as an expense in the profit and loss account, interest on a debenture 
again would be shown as an expense in the profit and loss account because the only difference is that it's a loan from the general public instead of from a bank. So at the end of five years, this piece of paper would be returned to the company, would be torn up because it's now out of date, and the investor would have made $1,000 each year over five years, which would give them $5,000. And at the end of the life of the debenture, they would also get back the original $10,000 they invested. So with this $10,000, it's worked for them and created another $5,000 on top. So slightly less risky than an ordinary share, but the downside of a debenture is that you have absolutely no voting rights and no invitation to the annual general meeting. So I'm going to run through um, the construction of the income statement and the balance sheet for a, a private limited company in this case, BCOM. And uh, you can see the income statement, which I've called the trading profit and loss and appropriation account, because we've got to divide up how the net profit um, is uh, distributed, if you like, between the shareholders and any retained profits. So uh, this is really the best way to learn how to put it together is to just listen as I go through it. And then obviously uh, with a different question, perhaps have a go at um, uh, solving them, uh, constructing an income statement and a balance sheet and then checking the mark scheme to see um, hopefully that you've got it right. Um, so the points that need to be highlighted is the beginning of the year is the 1st of January 2002. We can see on here also that the company has issued 1,005% debentures of $100. They have, at the beginning of the year, they have a balance brought down. So this is from last year. They had a general reserve of 18500 And they also had a retained profit last year of seven thousand and fifty dollars the profit for the end of this year so the end of if the beginning of the year is the first of january the on the end of the year would be the 31st of december is thirty six thousand dollars and then how do we construct the appropriation well they need to tell us how much of that thirty six thousand dollars they've given to their shareholders it tells you that here they did a interim dividend of seven percent on the ordinary shares and on the 31st of December, they decided to transfer um, $10,000 to the general reserve and pay a dividend of 9% on the ordinary shares. So halfway through the year, they paid 7%, and then at the end of the year, they're paying 9% on the ordinary shares. So all this information will be very important for when we come to construct the uh, appropriation account and the balance sheet. Um, so... I haven't put all the numbers in, but basically it's this is exactly the same as a trading a profit and loss account would be. You've got your sales minus your returns, 290000 is left after you take away the returns inwards. Your cost of sales was 100000 so that gives you a gross profit 190 nothing different there. Two points very important to note. Your director's remuneration, if you see that word remuneration, it simply means salary, and that's included as an expense. So just like you pay your wages of your staff, any director's wages um, get put in as an expense. And also we said that the debenture interest um, would also be shown as an expense in the profit and loss account in this case. So it just gets added as another, another cost basically. Add all these expenses together, you've got 154,000. Take that away from 190 gross profit. That leaves you with a Profit for the year, an operating profit is usually how you write it um, in a private limited liability company accounts. Uh, so we perhaps use net profit for sole trader and partnerships. They tend to prefer you to use the operating profit, um, but it's essentially the same thing. It's $36,000 in this case. So the additional bit, this bit here, is known as your appropriation account okay and that's going to show you how we divide up this thirty six thousand uh, dollars which we said was our net profit or our operating profit okay um so of that thirty six thousand if you remember earlier we talked about how ten thousand dollars is going to go to the reserves in this case the general reserve 
the preference share dividend is eight thousand dollars and the ordinary share paid if you remember there was seven percent that was paid that's five thousand two hundred and fifty that was an interim one and then the proposed is six thousand seven hundred and fifty at the end of the year so when you add all those together that gives you thirty thousand dollars Hang on, you had a 36,000 was the net profit. So the extra 6,000 is going to be your retained profit for this year. And then we had a retained profit bought down at the beginning of the year of 7,050. So when we add that to what we've kept this year, the retained profit carried down for next year is going to be the 6,000 from this year plus the 7,050 that we brought down from last year. So in total, our retained profit would be 13,050 and that would be shown in the bottom half of our balance sheet. So finally our balance sheet uh, for BCALM at the end of the year as at 31st of December would um, be very very similar uh, to a normal balance sheet. Um, it's worth pointing out first that the current liabilities these are all the debts that have to be paid within the year so if you remember um, at the end of the year when the dividend is decided it won't be paid immediately it will be paid in the next few days maybe weeks to the shareholders so any proposed uh, ordinary share capital uh, dividend that's going to be paid to those shareholders or proposed preference share dividend um, as well as the debenture interest if it hasn't yet been paid because remember that's going to be paid at the end of the year so all it might be 31st December is the end of the year, but it gets paid maybe on the 5th of January or the 6th. So when you actually construct this uh, balance sheet, it's still not left the bank account and left to the um, debenture holder. As with the ordinary and the preference shareholders, their dividend's coming, but it's going to come in the next week or so. So um, at this date, you know, remember this is a picture in time, we still not paid them, so they are effectively a current liability. So any proposed ordinary or preference dividend and the interest payment will all be an amount owing and will be shown as a current liability as a result. And finally, um, I've marked a few things here on the balance sheet that you should be aware of. Uh, a, an intangible non-current asset. Uh, that's the value of the non-physical fixed asset. So um, with some companies, they give the, uh, the value of goodwill which would be the value for the reputation of the company. Um, and in that case, uh, in this case, it's $100,000. So they're saying that our brand name effectively is worth $100,000. Very controversial because it's subjective. It's the opinion, really, of the company. Um, but it is allowed in uh, UK um, accounting law and also in the United States, as well as many other countries around the world. And it's known as an intangible asset because you can't actually touch it. It's not something physical. It's just the value we give the reputation of the firm. Uh, so that's part A and part B. Um, and then C, we've got two things here. We already discussed a little bit earlier. The retained profit is a combination of the retained profit from last year, which was 7,050, plus this year's retained profit of 6,000, which gives you a total retained profit of 13,050, which would be shown in the bottom half of the balance sheet under the title of capital and reserves. Uh, the general reserve, we put $10,000 aside this year, but we also, at the beginning of the question, it said had a reserve value um, bought down of 18,500. In other words, from previous years, they put into a general reserve 18,500. So when you add the 18,500 to the $10,000 from this year, the total um, general reserves is going to be 28,500. And then the ordinary shares issued were 50 cents each, 150,000. So that gives you $75,000 worth of shares. And the preference share capital was $100,000. Add all these numbers together, you get a balancing figure of 216,550, which should balance with the top half of the balance sheets.